I, I don't know if you remember way back at the beginning of the day um, when Rick spoke about his book, that seems like ages ago. He mentioned that uh, a large part of this challenge is political. I'm just going to offer some final words to kind of wrap up today about the political aspects and the political challenge and hopefully provide some insights from my perspective now as a, as a politician as to the kind of things that you need to do in thinking about a strategy that we all need to make this thing a reality. Uh, yeah, so I am a politician, I'm sorry about that. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the House of Lords in the UK and it's actually a delight to be here addressing an audience that's actually a lot younger and uh, uh, the average age is the Lords is 69, so that tells you something about. And also, actually, funnily enough, I think there are more women in this audience as well, so, and that's not saying much. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so it's, it's nice to not be standing in front of the Lords. I, I hope you're going to be a bit more gentle with me. And I know you sta I'm standing between you and a drinks reception, so I'm going to keep it brief. And, but there will be hopefully a chance for some questions. What are we doing in the UK? Well, I mean, and why, you know, why am I, uh, as a politician, kind of interested in Thorium? It's, it's really remarkable to me that, that we have uh, this, we've had this technology, we've known about this technology for so long, and yet we haven't, it hasn't been developed for, for all the advantages we've heard today. And so um, it was about 44 years ago when I met Kirk and he opened my eyes to this alternative nuclear um, op option which seemed to have sort of none of the nasties associated with the existing uh, industry. And, and I just had it in the back of my mind and really the thing I've been working on is, is climate change policy in general. And you know the nuclear issue used to come up and come up and I'd always be thinking what about this thorium idea and then Fukushima happened. And that happened about a, a week before I was uh, preparing my maiden speech uh, to, for that, to go into the House of Lords. And at the end of the speech, I just put in a reference to the fact that Fukushima had happened because I thought it was a really relevant thing and I wanted to make my speech relevant. And, and I said, you know, I think we ought to have an adult debate about alternative nuclear options. And that kind of then kick-started a, a kind of a flurry of interest and people saw that and got in touch with me and, and a, a guy called John Durham uh, contacted me and a, a retired businessman um, and he had um, well he had some money and some time to dedicate to advocating Thorium um, but and he wanted to set up an organization and I had the idea of setting up an organization I had no money and no time but I had a good name for it and that was the Weinberg Foundation so I said to John look why don't we join forces and let's establish an organization in Alvin's in Alvin's memory in his honor really to, to try and hope, ensure that, that his legacy which I, I believe should be far greater than it is is actually brought to life when we see this second era of nuclear that he always dreamt about and, uh, and the quote that was put up earlier today about him not being around to see it I think is a real sadness that we didn't do it earlier but let's all you know work in his name and, and try and make this a reality. So from a politician's perspective how can you win support from politicians? What do politicians care about um, in relation to energy? Well essentially they care about three things. Energy has to be secure no politician wants to be in office when the lights go out or when the pumps run dry. That is just a suicide, okay? So the number one priority is, above all else, it's got to keep flowing. It's got to be a secure form of electricity or all forms of energy. Um, secondly, it's got to be cheap. The other great thing that politicians hate is people grumbling about rising fuel costs or rising bills. So security and cheapness are the most important factors. And then the cleanness or otherwise, you know, whether it pollutes or how, uh, how bad it is for the planet is a really a third thing. I mean, it shouldn't be. From my perspective as an environmentalist, that should be the main thing that we worry about for the future of our children and the future of the planet. But in reality, that's not how politicians think. They think in short-term cycles where the things that are going to get them elected or not is what matters. For thorium and for the thorium reactors that you want to develop, you've got to show first and foremost that this is an improvement on our fuel security, on our energy security, and secondly, that it's going to be cheaper than the current situation, the current things that we rely on. And I think that's actually, you know, those two things are eminently you know, feasible with the designs that, uh, and, the, and the combination of thorium and molten salt reactors. I, I genuinely think you can set, tell a very good story about that. So that's the thing to lead on. And I think the fact that it's, uh, you know, cleaner and it's going to save the planet is a nice add-on. But, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the approach I would recommend. I think the other thing that's crucial, and I, I don't mean to sound, um, I don't want to do anyone down in this, but um, who does the lobbying and how you present yourself is so important. The politicians are really risk averse. They don't like taking a punt on something that hasn't got a track record. So, you know, in order to win this, you are going to have to build coalitions 
of people with a proven track record of making things change. So you, you, you're going to have to build coalitions of, of people who are out there doing things that have got recognizable credibility in a politician's eyes and then represent yourself with that coalition. And you have a great advantage here in, 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 the, in, in using thorium and molten salt reactors because you can build coalitions that are not the usual suspects. You don't have to just, do, you're not just talking to physicists and, and electricity companies. You can talk to uh, chemi chemical companies, industrial heat uh, users, uh, the medical research establishments. Because of all the co-products and co-benefits, you can attract names into this that are established in different industries, therefore carry credibility, but then uh, but they can be disruptive to the existing power base, the existing utility companies, existing energy companies. So that's what you've got to go and out and do, collect those brands, collect that credibility, build those coalitions, and I think, I think you can do it. And I think uh, Kirk was saying to me today that this conference is perhaps the first one where we've seen uh, a new audience coming to this conference who are investors and business people and in different industries, and, and I think that'll just continue to grow. As this message gets out, more and more people are going to see that there's an advantage in this, and this disruptive but well-proven and, and known credible coalition can come together. And I think I've been thinking about, um, you know, what's specific to the U.S. in all of this. You know, we've talked a lot about China today, and, and I, I have been out to China. I've talked to some of the scientists who, you know, confirm that it's all true. They're doing what they are, throwing huge amounts of resources. But you know, I'm, I'm a kind of big tent kind of person, and I don't see this necessarily as a threat or something we should get overly agitated about. But we should see it as a challenge, and we should rise to it and see it as a competition. And uh, and I think the U.S. has got aspects about its culture and the way that its, its political uh, kind of makeup that make it very different to China but it may succeed in a completely different way. So China's doing it from the top down, state driven, publicly funded mechanism, right? You guys don't have that luxury and you, so neither does Europe. You know, we live in capitalist societies where we try and have a small government, minimum, minimum interference really from politicians and we want private enterprise to flourish and, and freedoms and individual enterprise to, to succeed. So you, know, you kind of have this double challenge. You've got to prove not only can you bring thorium and molten salts to a reality, but you, you can also at the same time prove that that model, that capitalist freedom model works. But you know, to do that, you're going to have to harness all of that private enterprise, all that, that good kind of, uh, the, the best bits of capitalism. So that's the challenge, I think. But you know, you've got great examples, I think. And, and I was just thinking yesterday as I heard about you know, the SpaceX um, Dragon space flight landing. You know, this is amazing. This is a private company that's sending rockets into space and bringing them back down. I mean, could we have believed that like five or ten years ago? And that's, you know, that's Elon Musk. You know, he's a product of the American dream. You couldn't ask for a better poster child for this culture. So, you know, you want the Elon Musks of this world, the Bill Gates of this world, the Google guys uh, to be involved in this in some way. I really think that, or if not them, then the equivalent. There are many people out there who are billionaires on the back of noughts and ones, you know, the digital billionaires. But they're now realizing that actually the real world isn't made out of noughts and ones. It's physical. It's, you know, there's chemistry and physics and all those sorts of things. Elon Musk, when he was at university, said the internet was one of his interests, but the other interests were space travel and sustainable energy. You know, these guys have got a perspective on the world that is broad and that can, they can be harnessed. I, I really hope so, anyway. So anyway, that's, I should get off my soapbox, I think, really. I could probably go on a lot about what we're doing in the UK and um, some of the things that we've been doing under the Weinberg Foundation, but I'm kind of guessing you guys have been sat here listening for a long time, so actually, John, if it's okay, I'll just take some questions and then we can all go and have a drink. Does that sound okay? <laughs>
there's a growing awareness that we've got to inspire young kids into being engineers and scientists and chemists and physicists. You know, we can't expect everyone to just go and work in the city, which is kind of what's happening. Even if you've got a chemistry degree, you end up working for Goldman Sachs. And we've got to have, a, you know, a reason to go into these these new spheres. And I think the environmental challenge, I know that politi politicians are a different generation generally. They're a little bit older, a little bit set in their ways. But the, for young people, the environmental challenge is actually really inspiring and scary because they're the people people are going to have to live through it and, um, and I, I think that the idea that they could do something that would, that would change that and actually have a material impact is quite exciting. So that I think that's, that is definitely a hook. Um, politicians are just bad at keeping track of really you know, what's going on a generation below them so it might take some time for those young people to come through and, and really, uh, they'll probably go into industry I think. I think in industry reacts much more quickly than politicians generally. I understand that there's a picture of uh, Queen Elizabeth holding a uh, kilo or so of plutonium. Can you get a picture of her holding a similar amount of thorium? <laughs> wow, that is a really specific challenge. Um, you know, actually one of the things that if, when you become a peer of the realm is that you have a right to, uh, to speak to the Queen. Not directly, you can't just go up and say, hi Liz, but you know, you can... Uh, so, yeah, I can't promise, I'm sorry. I mean, actually what you want is Kate Middleton holding it. That, that's, more, that's, that's more possible, that's more possible. As a politician, how would you deal with a Republican who thinks that fracking is the greatest thing under God and he denies climate change? How would you deal with a gentleman like that? Do you have to deal with him? Is he that important? I mean, you have I, I guess the whole balance of, of what energy you develop when is, is, is I mean, I'm not anti-gas, right? And, I, and I, think, I think the fact that gas is cheap in the US right now is actually probably a, quite a good thing. I know there are problems with fracking, but um, you, know, you guys have now reduced your coal burn so substantially, you know, exporting it for the first time in a long time. This is going to bring your emissions down, you know, without realizing it. You're doing what you said you didn't want to do, which is solve climate change. So I'm not anti-gas, and I think it's needed as a bridging technology. So I, I guess I would, say, I would always say, this is another thing I wanted to say about how you position the lobby. Do it positively. Do it positively. Sell it on its benefits. Do not do down everything else. Don't get distracted into fights against other technologies. Don't try and kill existing nukes because they're dying anyway. Waste of your time. Certain, and embrace renewables, guys. I mean, I know I, I, I am a big tent person. I think all of these technologies are going to be needed. The renewables lobby does not fight within itself. You know, wind does not do down geothermal, does not, and that doesn't do down biomass. They keep themselves, you know, as a college, collectively pushing forward. That's what you've got to start to do. You've got to start to make friends with those renewables guys. Because actually, they're going to save you, I think. They, because they will fill in the gap when these existing nukes fall over. They'll buy you a 10-year gap. You get your technology commercialized in that 10 years, and you're off. And you're providing baseload to back off all of those renewables. So you're their friend. And not only that, I mean, Kirk's told me these wonderful facts, you know, like, well, as we know, you know, you dig out rare earth metals uh, to make your magnets for your wind turbines, you get a load of thorium, you know, so there's, there's synergies. When you use uh, concentrated solar power, uh, you use molten salts as the coolant. So there are synergies. This is, uh, this is an all going forward together. And if we have an enemy, it's coal. Absolutely, 100% it's coal. Let's just make them the bad guys, and everyone else should be clubbing together and working together. And, and that's how I really believe that helps. I see politicians as experts in PR. Uh, do you have any recommendations on how to fight the paranoia of radiation? It is crazy, isn't it, how um, paranoid we've become about something which is entirely natural. I, I mean, I, I guess. We have to um, just keep putting out those facts. And, uh, you know, there's the great book I saw someone reading, Radiation and Reason. You know, but that's too technical for a politician. You've got to get these messages down to really simple sound bites. Uh, that a banana is more radioactive, you know, that's, that, that sinks in, you know, that does mean something. It is just a question of just keeping on saying it until you're bored of your own voice. And uh, then that, by that stage, people will just about be starting to hear what you're saying. Maybe it is getting Kate Middleton to hold some thorium. Maybe that's it. I mean, honestly. On it, 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 we have to win the media over 
And how do you get to the media? You need celebrities. I mean, it's such a horrible thing to say that, but it's true. And so, you know, that's, we'll have to do that. <laughs> I'll take it as a note to myself, okay. <laughs> I think that's about it. Thank you so much. You've been so incredibly generous. If you just stay here one second.